Well, hello everyone. My name is Lee Weisenberger and I'm Dean of Admission and Financial Aid at Bates. And I wanna personally welcome you, but also on behalf of the entire Bates community, welcome you to back to Bates or back at Bates. And I hope you can appreciate uh, our fun play with the title of this weekend and set of programming that we have lined up for you. Um, we're thrilled to be with you, thrilled to be with you in this virtual world. While we certainly miss having all of you on campus and being able to celebrate in our traditional ways, um, again, we appreciate you joining us and are looking forward to bringing as much of Bates to you as we possibly can through Back to Bates or Back at Bates. Um, today, I am joined by many colleagues across campus, as well as a couple of students. So I'll introduce them briefly and then quickly turn to them as the experts to share all that is new on campus this fall. So first, joined by Malcolm Hill, our Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean of the Faculty. Also joined by Josh McIntosh, our Vice President for Campus Life and Dean of Students. We also have with us today, Aaron Foster Ziga, our Senior Associate Dean of Students, and Kim Trousenek, who is an Associate Dean of Students for Campus Life. As for students, we have two joining us today, proudly. Um, first, Bridget Thompson in the class of 2022. Uh, Bridget is a double major in art and visual culture and history and hails from Pennsylvania. While on campus, she lives in Smith Hall and is also a member of the CATS v COVID team. We also have Marcus Pacheco Soto from the class of 2024, so a new first year. Welcome again, Marcos. He's an international student from Chile and lives in Parker Hall, and he also is a member of the CAT v COVID team. So that's our, that's our crowd of experts today who will be sharing many stories from campus and want to start by recognizing that life on campus is certainly different, um, but the community is still thriving and strong, some could argue even stronger than ever. So with that, Josh, if I may first turn to you, can you give us an overview of how things are going with our students on campus? Sure, thank you, Lee. It's very good to be with you all today. Um, I thought I'd just have us take a look back and then we'll take a look forward uh, for a few moments. So, uh, so for our first year students, we began with a very different orientation experience back really beginning about mid-August moving many of what would have been on-campus in-person experiences into digital online modules. Um, and while there's been many challenges with COVID-19, one of the real benefits is it's caused us to really rethink the way that we develop content and provide content um, to our students. And so our students might be much more digitally savvy um, the many of the folks that, that work at the college, I think it created a moment of creative opportunity uh, to really deliver it in a far more paced out, spaced out way, on demand, on their time, in creating these modules about what to expect of Bates, what we expect of our students as they come to Bates, and the values and norms of Bates College. And so that um, had some asynchronous components to it, then it moved into having some synchronous components to it, and then of course, once students arrived on campus, we began to do some in-person things with our first year students. Um, so orientation began much earlier and well before students have arrived at Bates. Um, and then beginning on August 24th, our students were, are starting to arrive in a very phased, structured return to campus. Um, normally campus would be full of fanfare and congestion and crowds and parents and families and for obvious reasons that um, was not possible this year. So um, they kind of were scheduled to return to campus. They came first to our COVID-19 testing center, which I'll tell you more about in a moment, um, quickly got their keys and then arrived at their residence hall where there was a team of movers to help move their things into the building. I think um, I'll let the students be the judge of that, but my sense of interacting with students every day is that that went, I think, more smoothly than anybody would have expected with little no or no lines or wait anywhere in the pipeline. Um, and then um, they began a kind of in quarantine, in room quarantine, as we waited for COVID-19 test results to return. Um, a bit of an update on uh, COVID-19 testing. Underhill Ice Arena used to have ice in it. It is now our COVID 
uh, 19 testing center, um, which runs uh, five days a week right now, we'll be moving to four days a week beginning next week, it has become a highly efficient smooth operation. We are getting COVID-19 test results usually within 24 hours, as little as sometimes 12 hours of um, results time. Um, and all students are being tested uh, twice a week. It is probably one of the best tools we have to mitigate the transmission of COVID-19 on our campus. And so it is a critical uh, force um, as we manage through the year together. Um, we partnered with the Broad Institute down in Cambridge, Massachusetts, um, typically a genomics institute. They are now providing a massive COVID-19 testing platform, which we are taking full advantage of, as well as many other NESCAC schools and college universities across the state of Massachusetts. Um, we'll exceed 20,000 COVID-19 tests on this campus this week. Um, so those are all good signs. Um, and I think what we've been focusing on over the last two, three weeks as we settle into what I call a very scaled down, very spaced out, um, perhaps I might call it a more still, calm place of a Bates experience than you might think about previous years, is how do we form community and connection? And um, in this very different time where we all crave it, but the ways in which we do it have to fundamentally look quite different. And I think Kim Trostnick and the students will share a bit more with you about that. Um, we've had two active cases of student COVID-19 on this campus to date. Um, you'll hear a bit more about isolation and quarantine and how we're managing through that from Aaron in just a moment. Um, and we are setting our eyes now on module B. Um, for the second half of the fall semester and how do we begin to prepare students for what will become the November break um, as we get into the Thanksgiving winter break timeline. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Lee. Great. Well, thank you, Josh, for that exceptional overview. Um, massive, massive undertakings across the board and all has gone phenomenally well one could argue, um, but with a lot of preparation and work and just due diligence on the entire community's part. So thank you, Josh. I'm going to turn to Malcolm now, if I may, and not wanting to separate entirely the academic experience from what is the community student experience overall, because the academic experience is the core, but to ask you, Malcolm, and recognize that the experience academically does look very different this year, where we're in the two plus two model with faculty using new pedagogy and teaching and hybrid ways. So that said though, the essence of the Bates academic experience probably hasn't changed. So can you share with us some of what's new and what endures in this new model for our students and faculty? Sure, and, and <clears throat> thank you, Lee, and, and thanks, Josh, for that overview. I, I think we have experts that, that, are, that will come and talk to you in a little bit about the experience in the classroom and Marcos and Bridget, so I'm very thankful that they're here. Um, but first, welcome, everybody, to Back at Bates. This is a, um, I think this is indicative of kind of the, the, the environment that we're working in. We're being very creative, very resourceful, recognizing that we have some, some real objectives that we have to hit in terms of keeping our community safe and, and doing this in a smart way. But we're doing it in, in really remarkable ways and the classroom's no different. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on the, on the faculty side of things and, and what I do know about the students. But again, we have, we have experts in the, in the virtual house today. So, um, so we made, a, uh, as many of you know, uh, an emergency transition to remote instruction at the end of the winter semester last year, and as did um, virtually every institution across the U.S. And I, I think there's a lot to be um, proud of, of the way Bates handled that and, and the way Bates moved through that, that situation, which was, which was a, a stressor for everybody. But what we did over the summer, in the summer months, was, was really remarkable. The way that we very, as a community, came together and thoughtfully planned for what this academic year was going to look like. Um, and, and we knew we were going to have to be um, on the spot when it came to remote instruction. And so the faculty on this campus uh, took it upon themselves to train themselves up in just about every tool that's imaginable, thinking about creative ways that they could approach their classrooms. And then because we wanted to ensure that in-person experience for students, we as a community and the faculty voted for this uh, over the summer, <clears throat> voted in this modular approach to the semester, to the entire academic year actually. And both of those things meant that faculty were gonna be doing a lot of work uh, in, in any way, shape or form as they got ready for, for delivering uh, the remarkable Bates education. 
Um, and there were real successes there. We have found folks who've been incredibly creative in the way that they've approached their teaching, new technologies, new ways of framing classes, rethinking assignments, thinking creatively about, creatively about ways to build community, which can seem like a challenge when you're physically distanced, but faculty have done a remarkable job in that space. Um, really eager students. I will say it was incredibly heartwarming to come back on campus and have students just so thankful that they were back in this space, even if it was spaced out, as, as Josh said, spaced out and spread out <clears throat> and masked up. Um, we face challenges. You know, faculty certainly are, are trying to figure out how to do an in-person class. And so for many of you remembering classroom structures and, and spacing, that's not the way we're doing it. Everybody is spaced out. You've got six feet between students in a classroom. Everybody's wearing a mask. Some students are remoting in. They're, they're, they're um, on Zoom, but they're not in that classroom. Some students are asynchronous. They're in the classroom, but they're not in the physical space at the same time. And so faculty are trying to manage all of that simultaneously. It's a challenge, but our faculty are up to the task and they really are doing remarkable work. The other thing that we're dealing with is this modularity. Uh, we have doubled the pace of coverage of material. And so we know that students are, for especially for folks who've been here for a, a year or two, this is brand new. For our new students, this is new college plus uh, what seems like a normal way to teach. But for, for folks that have been here for a while, they recognize that this is a ramped up pace. And so we're just paying attention very carefully to, to the student experience and where the faculty are in this space. We're looking forward as well. We've got the winter semester in front of us. We're, we're in a solid place right now in the fall. We're gonna be attentive and responsive the whole way through, but we're trying to find uh, the, the successes so that we can carry out through the winter, winter term uh, in really remarkable fashion. So we can, uh, we can end at the end of the academic year and look back and say, um, this was a pretty, pretty remarkable moment in the institution's history. And so I, I'm, I'm all glad you all are here. Uh, thank you for joining us and, and look forward to having you back on campus in person when, when the time is right. And so with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Lee. Thanks, Lee. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm, for um, sharing all of that and um, eager to hear, as you said, from our students, what the experience has been like for them as they've returned to campus and have been in the Bates classroom. So um, Bridget, I'll, I'll turn to you first. How are things going? What's your experience been this semester? Anything and everything that comes to mind? Awesome, thank you so much, Lee. And thank you, Malcolm, for that great introduction as Marcos and I are student perspectives here on this webinar. Um, and I wanted to just also reiterate that Marcos and I are members of the CAPC COVID Student Committee. Um, and that's all about addressing COVID related issues on Bates College campus. And while the committee is faculty facilitated, it's student run. So it's really focusing on student issues and student voices surrounding this ever emerging issue of COVID on campus. And I really think that we're a really great accessible resource for students that's kind of changing and figuring out its purpose and its goals week to week because as we know, the situation is emerging and unfolding week to week. So that's a little bit about what we do as a committee. Um, and then in terms of what the student experience has been on campus thus far, I definitely wanna um, also re reiterate what Josh said about how smooth the transition was um, on campus that first day moving in. I had been in the car for about nine hours. Uh, in total, we hit a bit of traffic um, from my home in Pennsylvania. So I was super eager to get back on campus and my mom pulls up to Underhill where we went through extremely smooth um, transition in terms of testing, getting the materials we needed to move into our dorm and our key to our dorm. And then we had um, hired movers to help us move in. And I was on the fourth floor of my dorm. So I can tell you that having some people help me uh, bring uh, everything up when I couldn't have parents and family members do that was incredibly helpful and made the transition so much easier. So that could not have gone smoother, especially having been in the car for so long. I was very eager to get going. Um, so I gave my mom a quick hug goodbye and I was back, you know, in my junior year here at Bates. And I can't say like enough how grateful I am to be back on campus in whatever form that may be. And I think that Bates has done a great job of trying to um, ensure that values that we prize as a school, like community, um, and connection are still happening, just sometimes in different ways, and I really appreciate that. In terms of what the academic situation looks like for students, 
um, as Malcolm was kind of just mentioning. With the modules, it is more material that's getting covered in a smaller amount of time. But I think that professors have done a great job of kind of altering their syllabus um, and being aware of this altered time scale. Professors have continued to be really accessible um, for students. And when I've spoken about what the module system looks like for my fellow peers and classmates, students have kind of communicated they really like the ability to be able to really kind of dive in and focus on two classes at once rather than being split across four different disciplines. So there are definitely some really great positives and it's been really great to see students kind of being flexible about this new process. And I'm really hopeful about what module B is gonna look like this fall and what we can kind of um, experience in the coming winter semester as well. Um, so that's a bit about what I feel like, how great the Bates experience has been as a student thus far, how happy I'm to be back on campus. I'm gonna turn it back to Lee and I'm sure Margaret will share a bit too about what we're experiencing right now. Excellent. Well, thank, thank you, Bridget, for all of that. I'm glad things are going well thus far and hope that certainly continues. Um, so Marcos, I'd love to turn it to you and ask you to just speak a bit about your experience this semester. Sure, well, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, and I wanna start thanking all, like, all of you for all the hard work you do. I, I'm just like surprised in a very positive way and I feel like super supporter. I feel like that's the word uh, support because well, coming from another country, it's always hard. And especially now during COVID times, uh, I felt super supported by the international uh, like student advisory committee, like Dean Rees. Uh, they were super helpful in, in, in terms of like getting me to campus and other international students as well. Um, so I'm very grateful for that. And about residential life and academics, I feel like I share most of like Bridges' feelings about what's going on in here. I feel like the transition has been super smooth and professors are always like super aware of the situation in which we're in and they are always like able to support you. And another important thing is that they are aware that this is still going on. So it hasn't ended and they are able to introduce like all of the actual juncture actual in the classroom and have insightful discussion in, in to to move on basically. Um, but I, I don't feel like adding much to what Bridget said because I, I feel like she just put in the right words, yeah. Great. Well, thank you, Marcos. And we might come back to you and ask you a few more questions about being a first year student in particular as you think about starting your college career in such unprecedented times, but I'm glad you and Bridget uh, share similar experiences. Um, to maybe uh, broaden some of those comments and stories, I'd love to turn to Kim uh, to speak a little bit from the institutional perspective. We certainly know, Kim, that everyone's curious about how we're able to continue to build community and what many people love about the Bates community during this time. So can you speak to some of the opportunities that we've made available on campus through student programming? Yes, I'd be happy to. Good to be with you all. While it is definitely true that social life and building community on campus is quite different these days, um, our students are really quite extraordinary, and I'm reminded of that every single day. We've had to think in our office, Campus Life, we oversee clubs and organizations and have our hands in a lot of the late night and evening weekend programs. And with campus partners and with our students, we've had to really think differently and creatively of how we build community um, in this new world order, if you will. And what that has meant for us has really been sort of scaling things down. I mean, those of you that know, state students, it's not uncommon for 800 people to come out for a particular event or, or a concert or whatnot. So really thinking creatively, you know, how do you build that community in smaller and smaller pockets that re really reflect the, the diverse interest of our students? So in the weekends, what we've been trying to do is hold at least three um, in-person programs on Friday and Saturday night. Some of them happen concurrently. Some of them happen in multiple different time slots so we can get as many students in as possible. Some of those events are hybrid. Um, we're always thinking of our, our virtual students. 
um, and those uh, that might want to engage virtually. So we have all of these different things going on all the time to address all the different um, interests and needs, um, especially with, uh, with large scale programming, just frankly not being possible, you know, right now. Um, student clubs and organizations are critical right now and have always played a major role in the social life and, the, and building community on campus, but even more so now. Um, because student clubs and organizations, there's naturally a shared interest that students can circle around and they lend themselves better for some of the smaller scale programming that, uh, that we're seeing more and more of on campus. Um, so they've been really, really wonderful partners in really thinking through how we can get students you know, out of their rooms, you know, into spaces where they can be together in person as well. And they're also being really cognizant of their students that are, that are studying remotely and how do you actually still engage those folks and not make them feel like they are not part of the community. And I think they've done a, a great job in that. Um, I think we're starting to get a rhythm with this, you know, finally, and I'm hoping to see as the weather gets colder, you know, students have been taking advantage of the beautiful, we've had been blessed with an amazing fall, beautiful weather, and taking advantage of outdoor opportunities as much as possible. So if everything from field games to movies on Garcelin Field, to arts and crafts happening in every pocket that we can get our hands on on any given uh, weekend night. Um, and I'm think, I think we'll see a lot more of that as, uh, as we start uh, coming indoors a little bit more. Um, but yeah, the, I think we'll see a lot more of that going forward. And really, the students can also really lead a lot of the programming too. So we've been trying to actively sort of encourage that for students as well, whether that's in their residences or with clubs and organizations, or just a student with a great idea. We have so much funding and resources um, and support for students to um, really come up with a great idea. And it doesn't even have to be that great of an idea, something that builds community on campus. We will, get, we will provide them with support to do that. And that fund is called Late at Bates. And it's just one of the many initiatives that we have on campus to help students actually lead their own programming and social opportunities on campus. So we're really trying to push that. Um, and there's lots of places to look. I think the hardest thing to do is to market to college students. So sometimes just peer to peer word, word of mouth works best. So I'm lucky to have my partners in Cats versus COVID here and in constant conversation about what that can look like. Um, matter of fact, we just met last night and we were thinking about all these like kind of cool ideas of how do we actually illustrate and demonstrate the kinds of things that we could do on campus together with, with a little bit of uh, creativity. So I think it's been great. It's been very different, um, but uh, like I said, our students are extraordinary and I think there's a lot of creativity and a lot of interest in figuring out how we do this um, because just because we're physically and socially distant, it doesn't mean that we're not connected and um, I, I see that every day. So it's been great, challenging, but great. I want to hear from Marcos and Bridget on that as well, because they, I'm sure, have a lot to say. So if there's time, it would be great to circle back with them. Thank, thank you, Kim, for that broad overview, but even more just the work behind all of that. You speak with such energy and enthusiasm that it makes it seem easy, but I know there's a massive matrix that's in your brain and beyond um, putting all of those pieces together. So thank you. Um, so Erin, I would love to turn to you um, to speak about the first year students in particular. So Josh alluded to this earlier, um, but how was orientation different this year? Can you give us some of the highlights and insights? Absolutely. And so um, orientation in COVID times, right? Um, Marcos and Bridget uh, both spoke about the importance of community and connection here at Bates and um, all of us know that these are fundamental. And so one of our challenges was trying to figure out how we could replicate community and connection um, during a, what uh, really needed to be a remote orientation. So remote orientation was released on um, August 17th. It was a collaborative project between Student Affairs, Bates Communication, and David Fuller, an esteemed Bates alum uh, from the class of 1975, who we are so lucky um, that he volunteered much of his time to film and produce many of the videos. So the first year experience focuses on really six values and we wanted to make sure that we were front loading those in orientation. Equity, inclusion, access, anti-racism and educational justice. Uh, we focused on community, academic integrity and exploration, purpose and identity, health and wellness, and really a sense of place that I think is so important to so many of us here at Bates. So, 
We had about 30 videos. It featured over 75 Bates community members, faculty, staff, and students. And um, our first year has completed asynchronous videos and activities. They also had the opportunity to meet their junior advisors and their first year seminar instructors through this. Um, some of the highlights of the videos are the six values of orientation I mentioned, um, support and campus resources so that our students could meet and recognize support staff prior to their arrival here. We talked about the Bates mission and history. This included um, really an amazing video um, introducing Bates alumni for our first year is kind of from 1884 to 2018. We had videos on confronting our history, conversations highlighting research, collaborations between students and faculty, which really wrestles a lot with our um, origin story. And so um, that was really, uh, really well received and incredibly uh, powerful and engaging the liberal arts and academics. Um, so orientation and opening also included isolation and quarantine in these COVID times. Um, as Josh mentioned, when a student enters quarantine, they were identified as a close contact with someone um, or they were tested at Bates Health Services because of symptoms. They also had access to several support services through our opening. Um, all students in quarantine and isolation virtually met with the manager of outreach and student support. They continued to have check-ins and Zoom meetings remotely um, with folks and daily check-ins by our Bates Health Services medical providers. Each student received a care package and that was filled with um, snacks from dining and messages from residence life and cleaning supplies from facilities. And so we really um, worked to continue that community and connection through our opening, even in, in these times of COVID. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we could replicate orientation as much as possible. Having a different version this year uh, was a learning curve for all of us, but we hope that we were able to maintain the things that make Bates, Bates. And um, a version of ASOP, I'm proudly wearing my ASOP uh, swag today, but we had orientation week leaders do community building events. We had a two day ASOP activity which had lots of experiences like gardening, music, art, woodshop, um, lots of cool and new things so that students could get to know Bates as a place, Maine as a place, and their fellow uh, first years. And so we'll continue orientation into the semester with the first year experience workshops and have programming that will focus on academic support resources and partnerships with the Dean of Faculty's Office, ARC and Student Affairs. So although I would say it was different this year, um, it was really an important kind of moment for all of us in student affairs and our campus and community to come together, even remotely. And what you heard from Marcos and Bridget really still stands. We want to know our students. And even in these remote times, it's really, really important that they know Bates and know each other and know the history. So, um, so that was opening for us. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Erin, for that. Just listening to that menu of options of videos alone. Um, leading up. There's so many that I wish I could have taken advantage of. Um, so thank you for all that went into that incredible programming. So we have some time now. Um, so again, families, alumni, thank you for joining us to back at Bates. If we were in a room around with one another. Um, we'd probably look to the audience for questions, but I know there are some more, there's some stories here um, that folks have still to share. So I'm gonna start to ping around with a couple of questions and um, see what sort of conversation organically starts to take shape. So where we just finished with Aaron talking about orientation, Marcos, I am gonna put you on the spot as the first year joining us today. Can you tell us about um, what it was like going through some of the virtual orientation programming, what stood out to you? And then once you arrived on campus, how did that all um, sort of come to life? Yeah, well, uh, thanks for sharing, Erin. I, I feel super privileged, to be honest. I looking like through all those materials uh, during orientation made me realize of all the resources we have available for us, uh, all the like super network that's here at Bates for, for us to, to use and cooperate with. And it made me realize of all the necessary conversations that we have to have, specifically around diversity, equity, and inclusion nowadays, and how that's even 
with the COVID juncture that we are experiencing. Um, so personally, my experience with the modules was was great. Uh, I actually took them very seriously and I feel like most of the students did as well. And it was a moment of reflection. Um, and as you were asking me Lee, about like this transition of like get, trying to get all this content here on campus, I feel like that uh, reflection has moved into action and, and I think it's just like a matter of time to see all the new initiatives uh, to get like those conversations going into actual projects and, and I feel like well working with student affairs and Kim I feel like student programming is gonna just keep moving forward uh, so I'm super excited and looking forward to that yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Marcos. And I can just add ever so briefly, I helped with move in and um, or have done it in the past. And it's been certainly wonderful to have crowds of folks. Um, there did seem this particular energy where students arrived with a sense of awareness that was well beyond what they maybe had in years past and a sense of purpose. and you might be saying, how did you glean all of that, Lee, as they were just coming in and out of doors, but um, they just stood proud as I think of the first years in particular, um, that was really exciting. And I do think attributed a bit to the orientation to say the least. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Bridget, you had mentioned earlier that move in, return went well for you, went smoothly. Um, anything else you'd like to share particularly or elaborate on? Yeah, absolutely. I could probably talk about this for hours. Um, one thing I definitely wanted to mention, and Kim recommended that we circle back about this, but um, particularly student programming, I kind of feel like at this moment, the world's kind of our oyster when it comes to um, determining like what we want to do as fun activities as members of campus and kind of finding like new and fun ways to stay engaged, obviously in this new post COVID world or currently COVID world. Um, so recently, I'm actually vice president of Special Olympics Club on campus, and we held a really fun outdoor mask decorating event. Um, it was really great. It was right outside alumni. The weather was beautiful. We all socially distanced, but um, decorated our own masks with fabric markers and gloves. And it was just really nice to kind of be together with other people in an outside setting where the weather was so beautiful. Um, and a lot of these masks are going to make their way to the John F. Murphy home in um, Auburn, Maine. So we're still finding ways to um, engage with the local Lewis and Auburn community, but also to keep um, our students safe um, and to keep everyone's health and safety as a priority. But I'm really excited in our discussions as a committee about fun ways that we can either encourage students to come up with their own programming or at least spread the word about the current programming that's existing. I know tons of friends and teammates that have enjoyed really going to the paint nights and bingo nights. Um, happening typically on Friday and Saturday nights, and uh, also the movie nights on Garson, the drive-in movies have definitely been a hit. So I think um, it's definitely a silver lining, not to say that we haven't had great programming in the past, but I think it's really amazing to recognize the capacity that students have for um, addressing change and kind of reacting to change and adapting. So I'm super excited to see how this is gonna progress over the next couple of weeks too. Thank you so much, Kim, and thank you, Lee. Thank, thank you, Bridget. Um, we could, again, probably talk about campus life for hours, as you suggested, Bridget. I might take a moment to turn it back to Malcolm and thinking about um, the innovative ways in which our faculty adapted both to the modules um, and just the classroom setting, literally the physical classroom setting. Are there any particular creative anecdotes that come to mind or um, stories when you sat back and said, wow, our faculty are really being creative in this moment. Uh, yeah, thanks, Lee. I, I think um, there are quite a few examples of places where faculty have, have uh, gone, gone above and beyond, including things like uh, for our Earth and Climate Science Department, which used to be geology, they've had to think very creatively about how do you drive around in vans uh, to get to to spots when you're you know all masked up and um, and so just the creative creativity that's gone into just 
the mapping out of these very logistically challenging uh, spaces to preserve a remarkable and important part of the educational experience for students. I've been really inspired by that. That's uh, like a low tech uh, solution where creativity is involved, but there are some high tech solutions as well. Um, one class, a professor found initially that there were some troubles with all the students, especially those that were zooming in from remote. Uh, troubles with them hearing <clears throat> the conversations of everybody in the room. And you can imagine masked up and six feet apart for every student, that might present some challenges. And so working with our um, information and library services folks uh, led by Pat Shokneck, uh, and they've done a tremendous job getting us situated. They found a way to put microphone space around the room. So when students have questions now, they can walk up to the microphone, speak directly into it. And that way you don't miss any of the conversation. Now it takes some training and preparation and you gotta, you gotta go walk up to a microphone. But um, it just is one more example of the ways that faculty have been, been really, really thoughtful about, um, about inclusion. How do, we, how do we ensure that everybody has access to the educational opportunities in this space? And uh, it's, it's something to be really, you know, to, to marvel at because I think the faculty have done really ph phenomenal work. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. I appreciate you just giving a couple of those stories to help families and alums understand the transitions we've made. And um, that's only scratching the surface. Um, I'm glad you gave Pat Shokinect and the ILS team a shout out where they um, really made massive, massive adjustments to make all of this fly for our students and faculty. Um, to go back to our students, you both mentioned or at least alluded to, um, while the modules are fantastic um, for a whole host of reasons, particularly as we try to keep public health and safety paramount, um, certainly it is a bit of a condensed schedule. So how, how have you managed your time? Um, how have faculty been helpful or instructive in you navigating a dense amount of content in a shorter period of time. Um, maybe Marcos, if I could ask you to speak first, recognizing fully this is your first time at your first semester at Bates, but but how how are you managing it? Yeah, well, uh, of course, I'm going to speak from a personal perspective. I feel like everyone works differently when it comes to academics and how to study, how to prepare for tests. Uh, but for me, it has worked in the way that. I have the same classes every day at the same time. So I, I've kind of like built this uh, routine uh, that is actually working for me. Uh, still like, you know, need some adjustment, adjustments, but uh, it's getting there. Um, and the professors are just super understanding of our needs. And uh, I feel like that's a, that's a great support in terms of moving forward. Uh, I haven't had any specific circumstances that have been like hard in a way i feel like every time i needed help it's just it, it comes in communication and speaking with your classmates with your professors and they they definitely provide the opportunities for you to to improve and for you to i don't know get an extension if you need it so communication has been definitely key and and the the response from the school has been has been great yeah thank you marcos bridget anything you would add yeah absolutely kind of echoing a bit of what marcos was saying in that the resources that we have students have not gone away whatsoever they're just sometimes presented in a different form but i'd say in some cases professors are even more available and and um open to students than they were before and that's because of the capacity that they have to interact with students virtually. So if they're maybe not on campus during their office hours at that specific time, or maybe they're not on, camp on campus at all, that's not a barrier at all to getting in contact with them. You just set up a Zoom. Um, and I think that uh, a lot, uh, unfortunately, occasionally with classes, you feel like there's a lot of screen time, right? So whether or not your class is in person, you're often on your computer doing things, we're always on our phone, um, you know, checking things out. And I think I stress for me the importance of getting off the screen occasionally, just giving myself a break like that. Maybe um, kind of go in pen and paper with an assignment or reading something. I, I like to have, have the pages in my hand sometimes. Rest in peace to the Bates printers though, because I use them way too often. I think I've killed many trees, I'm sorry. Um, but I would just say like taking those necessary breaks and recognizing like mental health wise when you kind of need to check in and take a break from the screen.
but I would just say that we're so fortunate to be able to have a majority of in, like, in-person classes. And although we are um, wearing masks and we're six feet apart, there's something to be said about sitting in a classroom and seeing other people and seeing your professor standing before you. It's kind of difficult to put into words, but it really makes a big difference. So while things look a little bit different, there's, I'm honestly shocked and surprised and like, like my heart is warmed by all the things that also remain about the academic experience for students. Thank you, thank you, Bridget, for that. I can say that I've certainly started writing more. I realize my penmanship needs a little assistance, but uh, I am with you there. Um, with that idea of mental health and thinking about well-being, um, Josh, you mentioned earlier, obviously, what was the ICE arena, ICE rink has transitioned to testing, um, but can you speak a little bit about fitness opportunities beyond Underhill, other athletic opportunities? How are people taking care of themselves um, and giving themselves those breaks that Bridget alluded to? Sure, and I think, you know, Bridget Martha's chimed in, but to kind of go off what Kim had been sharing a little bit before of um, the weather, it has been a very dry fall and a relatively warm fall, at least by main standards, relatively warm. And so there are Adirondack chairs outside, there are students eating on gar salons, you go to the track, the fields, there are students outside, people have yard darts, it's very, um, it's a very different feel outside. Um, and I think that's fantastic. And so also mindful that sitting on Garcelon Field um, will not be particularly pleasant in December, January, or February. Um, we're going to be opening up more spaces on campus, um, probably going to be later this week or next week for students to be using in the evening, night, and weekend hours. Um, but we've taken what was in the Davis Fitness Center, so the, the weight equipment was in Underhill uh, in the Davis Fitness Center, and for, I think, obvious reasons, um, we wanted to get all that weight equipment out of the testing center, um, again, to minimize congestion, et cetera. So that equipment, the weight equipment, has been put on a tennis court um, in Merrill and spread way out to ensure physical distancing. Um, and so students now um, need to schedule a time to go work out to use a piece of equipment in a window of time. And as a result of the need for physical distancing, faculty and staff can no longer use our athletic facilities to make students and their access to these spaces the utmost priority, um, which I know is a, is a significant trade-off for our faculty and staff, but if we keep students and their experience at the center of this, it's already tight in terms of the equipment and scheduling. I am we're also offering a number of virtual courses um, and other classes, um, fitness and workout classes on campus. So it's this hybrid between in-person and virtual. I was talking to some students that have gotten, um, they're obviously getting more equipment, just like people are doing around the country for their own rooms. So bands and weights, et cetera, for their own room um, for those that want to. So that's how we're thinking about the kind of fitness athletics piece. And then of course, obviously our coaches while we're not running a competitive fall season, are still doing an awful lot of work around team and fitness and working out and being together uh, with their students. So that team spirit, that sense of connection, I think remains vital even in athletics, where I think most people would instinctually think, oh, that just all went away. Um, and so that still is being sustained. Josh. Th thank you, Josh, for all of that. Um, I'm mindful of time here, but I want to maximize the opportunity. I know, Bridget, you're a fellow field hockey player, um, so a proud Bates Bobcat there. Can you speak to what it's been like when you would think of this as ordinarily being field hockey season? Yeah, I mean, um, I definitely was bummed. And I mean, we saw across the country a competitive fall season just weren't happening. Um, but I've got to say for the past couple of weeks, we've gone through a phase return in terms of practicing. And, and there's just something to be said about being on the field with certain numbers of your teammates and just playing the sport that you love. Obviously it's not a full fledged season, but I'm so incredibly grateful to be out there on campus Avenue field, um, playing the sport that I love with people that I love. And I think that we're finding new and creative ways to stay engaged and um, part of a team. And we're trying to be there for all members of our team, but particularly first year athletes and students um, on our team, because we know this is definitely 
even more difficult transition for them. But um, our coach, our coach has been incredible as usual. And I think that we're just recognizing that this is just an extended off season. So we're working just as hard as we normally would. And we just have our goal set um, a little further in advance. But I got to say, I think that athletics has done a very great and considerate job of like ensuring student safety, but also allowing us to practice the sports that um, we really love to play. So very proud to be a member of the field hockey team and a Bobcat. Thank you, thank you, Bridget, for that. And I love your spirit. So I hope it remains and um, you're able to stay with the team for certain throughout this fall and get that spirit um, continued to be fired up there. So um, maybe just one last question, if I may, to Aaron, where I'm thinking back again to some of Josh's comments, thinking about wellness and fitness um, and some of the students turning to thinking about their dorm life being perhaps a little different or what they can accommodate in their room. Can you speak to um, what residential life looks like specifically? Absolutely. So it gets back to what I was saying. Community is an essential part of the value system here at Bates. And when students, alums, and others talk about Bates, I think that word community comes up frequently. And I think it's what draws students to Bates. That's on-campus opportunities outside the classroom. Oftentimes there were students, particularly first-year students, start to feel connected um, and, and feel a sense of belonging to the community. And so our Residence Life Department and Health Education um, wants to help students uh, a point of entry into the larger experience here about connection, belonging, community. And so junior advisors and first year centers often is the space and the place um, that we develop those ideas that play to interest to groups. And so in some residence halls, they've been shared activities like ping pong or creating art or catchphrase or spike ball. And others are um, socially distant sharing meals or having conversations um, outdoors in some of the Adirondack chairs that Josh talked about. But I think that having something to do residentially and share pieces of yourself can feel like a really important part to feel connected and like you belong in your space. And so um, it is different this year in some ways. And I think the important thing is it's not the activity, it's the connection between our Res Life staff and our students and that matters to us. Um, I think it matters to students. I think that for upper class students, having someone to check in with and talk through their experience is also a really important part of navigating this evolving relationship with connection and community across their years here. And so we like to think of Res Life as moments of engagement being at the center of their experience here outside the classroom. And that continues even, um, even in COVID times this fall. So we're proud of the work of our Res Life staff and um, we will continue to work and connect with students in these times that can be really challenging. Uh, remote, remote everything um, is just not, uh, not what we're hoping for. And so when we can connect and communicate, I think those are the spaces and places that we wanna do that residentially. Well, th thank you, Erin, for that. And I'll say, um, ending with the themes of community and connection are really important and is also a key piece of the back at Bates it's been back to Bates in previous years, but back at Bates. Um, so as we think about the next few days and extra programming that families and alums will um, take part in, hope that you're finding that community and that connection with all of us. Um, so before I share a couple of um, highlights uh, to think about what's ahead, I wanna take a moment to thank all of my exceptional colleagues and students um, for making this session, this panel, if you will, possible um, to hear from the experts, to hear from Malcolm, Josh, Kim, Aaron, and then certainly Marcos and Bridget really um, hopefully brought Bates to life for you to really understand what fall has been like thus far and what we hope it will continue to be. Um, as we look ahead, for um, Back at Bates programming. We appreciate you kicking things off with all of us and starting your um, Friday Back at Bates with us, but know there's a plethora of options ahead. Uh, so coming up right now, you have the opportunity to join men's lacrosse, Bates men's lacrosse, and learn about life after Bates from Sam Francis. Uh, Sam is a member of the class of 2017 who now works for the Cincinnati Bengals. 
You can also check out Safera, an event organized by Latinos Unidos and the Caribbean Student Association to celebrate Hispanic Latinx culture with student performances. And lastly, but by no means least, at 9 p.m., I'm sure Kim had something to do with this, uh, um, we will have our virtual Village Club Series Showcase event with both student and alumni performers. So lots of great options um, to see our students and the Beats community in action tonight. Uh, tomorrow, um, you can start with us not too, too early. So we'll kick things off at 10 a.m. tomorrow and building off of Josh's highlights with athletics and fitness at Bates. We'll, um, the programming will include boot camp from Garcelon Field to get you moving, along with remarks from President Spencer and, of course, our alumni award presentations. Um, so it wouldn't be Bates again without cheering on our Bobcats, so don't miss the replay of last year's game under the lights against Bowdoin. And Coach Malik Hall and some of our senior players will be providing commentary along the way. So it'll be a fun way um, to view Bates football and something you won't want to miss. So I can't thank you enough um, for joining us this weekend, for joining back at Bates. Um, we hope you stay in touch virtually, but certainly hope to see you again in person sooner rather than later.